Baptist Church. I'm thankful that you're here, and uh, we're looking forward to all that the Lord has in store for us this evening, and we're going to begin our meeting in a word of prayer, and so I ask you just to join with me as I pray, you pray, and let's ask the Lord to meet with us here this evening. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we come before thee this evening and thank thee again for the privilege of coming into thy presence. We pray, O oh Lord, that thou will be glorified in this place, that thou will please help us. Lord, we are poor and needy. And so often prone to wander, we need thy grace and help tonight. Satan would love to throw distractions in our mind and in our heart. And Lord, he's such a good accuser of the brethren, uh, telling us how unworthy we are. But Lord, we pray tonight and we plead the blood of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And it's by his wounds and his stripes that we're healed. It's in him that we have strength and life. And so we pray tonight, Father, help us to look to Christ. And for those tonight who are outside of Christ, who do not know him, May they come to Him while there's time. May they put their faith and trust in Thee. May they come to know Thee and know that their sins are forgiven. Oh Lord, we pray tonight, be glorified in our worship. Keep our heart and our minds fixed upon Thee, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll take our hymn books and we'll stand and sing hymn number 331. Hymn number 331, we'll stand and sing, A ruler once came to Jesus by night to ask Him the way of salvation and light. The master made plain, made answer in words, true and plain, ye must be born again. We'll stand and sing hymn number 331.
verse together and the chorus. Uh, verse number four, a dear one in heaven, my heart yearns to see. Let's sing that together. A dear one in heaven, my heart yearns to see. At the seated. We'll take our Bibles. Turn with me to the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation, and uh, we'll go to Revelation chapter number two. Revelation chapter number two. With God's help, we'll look there this evening. Revelation chapter number two, as we continue looking at the different churches there in Asia. And we're going to look tonight at verse, beginning in verse number 12. We'll read down through several verses. Eight, Revelation chapter number two, beginning there in verse number 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write these things, saith he, which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was, who was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of the, the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast stumbling blocks before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. And we'll stop our reading just there in verse number 17. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Hold your place there, and we will come back to that portion of Scripture here in just a few moments. Um, but before we do, we'll take our hymn books again and stand and sing another hymn. Hymn number 408, hymn number 408, are you trusting Jesus all along the way? Does he grow more precious to your heart each day? Are you his disciple? Test the word and see, he will give the Spirit more abundantly. We'll stand and sing hymn 408.
just like to go over a few notices and announcements, some things to make you aware of, and things that are going on in the life and ministry of our church, and good things, things to be excited about and to be praying for. Let's continue to remember those amongst us who are unwell. Both Jenny is unwell and Eddie, they've both spoken to me to let me know they were unwell, and I'm continuing to pray for them, pray that the Lord will strengthen them and bring them back to full health. Others as well who are going through difficulty, continue to pray for one another and lift one another up before the Lord. Let's continue to pray for, um, pray for our sister churches all throughout the country. Let's remember even that our new church plants and remember the church in Carlisle today. Continue to pray for it and pray that, they, that the Lord would bless and strengthen the work there through Jonathan and Gracie. And let's not forget, God willing, in the month of August, there's going to be a new church opening in Crowborough. And uh, a lot of exciting things happening. Three, uh, three churches in, in, uh, in this uh, short period of time. And we're excited about what the Lord is doing. And so please keep those things in prayer and make plans to attend. A lot of exciting things happening. Uh, let's continue to ask the Lord to, to work um, in Camp Victory. And many of you have given to camp, both uh, financially and also donating different food and things to go to the camp. And we are down there preparing. Joy and I and Rosie and others are down there working every day during the week and uh, trying to do many things. We're, one of the things they're trying to do is build a... A, a proper structured cafe or a tuck shop on the property um, that will have a balcony overlooking the, uh, the, the sunken garden. It's quite a big, uh, a big task that's going on, and we're trying to do it in two weeks. And so don't worry, it will be safe enough for you to walk out on it. Um, but it is a lot of work, and so pray for those who are down there. And um, it's going to be very hot tomorrow and, uh, and Tuesday, so pray the Lord give them strength, give us strength and help. Um, and also for the organizing of the camp. Many of the speakers are planning to come and have been contacted, and we're praying that God works in a great way at camp. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for a camp. And I know that's hard to believe, but at 18, I was heading in a completely different direction. And the Lord led me to go to a camp the last week of summer. I was about to go to university to play, uh, to begin sports, and to carry on with my degree. And God dealt with me in such a way that I couldn't go on to that university. I had to go and change my direction and go. The Lord changed my direction, and I, I ended up going to a Bible college. I had no clue what that meant, but I just knew if I went to a secular university, it was not going to be a good thing. And the Lord dealt with me there, and it's through all of that that the Lord led me to, to, to preach and then eventually led, uh, led me to England. And so we give God the glory. One week at camp, imagine that. Whole lives, families, wor the world can be changed in one week at camp. And so let's pray that for many of our young people. Uh, let's pray. One of our young people is here tonight, Luce, and it's good to have him in the meeting. He's going to be traveling back to uh, see some of his family in South Africa over the next five weeks. So please do pray for him. And uh, he's excited, and we're excited for him. So pray that God would bless him as he goes there uh, to visit with his family and that the Lord will bring him back safely. So keep him in your prayers as well. Um, there are other things that we're praying for. I just want to mention, many of you know, we've been praying for the roof, and uh, our, our roof has been leaking substantially. Now, it hasn't rained too badly since the last time it leaked, so we give God the glory for that. Um, but we, are, um, we have been getting different quotes and speaking to people about getting the roof repaired, and uh, going forward by faith, and the Lord has met us. And we've been contacted by uh, people who want to help and um, give towards the roof, and we give God the glory for that. And so we are um, going to move forward with the roof being uh, fixed, and uh, so we're, we're looking forward to that, God willing. It'll take place sometime here in the next week or so, next two weeks or so, uh, so please keep that in prayer. Uh, you're always a bit hesitant, aren't you, when you deal with builders, and you try your best, you read as many reviews as you can, you talk to as many people as you can, and we're just trusting the Lord that He's going to give us the best ones that we could possibly have. Pray that that roof won't, roof won't leak, and I know the first time it rains hard, we're all going to hold our breath for a moment, and we're going to look around, and then we're going to give God glory when no water comes through. So we're looking forward to that, and so please keep that in your prayers over the next couple weeks. Um, continue to, uh, to pray for the work going on next door, and uh, we're continuing to press on. If you have an interest in helping there next door with any kind of work, uh, please speak to David. I'm not able to be there over the next couple weeks just because of being at Camp Victory. But David is, is going to be working at different times over there. And if you would like to help him, please let him know. And uh, I think him and Cezanne were over there and putting up this, the trim and the skirting board and the architrave. And so if you're able to go over and help with any of that, we'd love to have your help. And I'm sure he would love to have your help as well. And so um, please keep that in mind. And then one other thing to just make you aware of, 
this coming Saturday, we're going to have a big work day at the ministry hall. So please come. Um, we're going to get started at 9 o'clock, and we're going to have loads of uh, demolition equipment there uh, to get things cleared out and get that part of the ministry hall up and running properly. And so come over and help us strip out some carpet and cut off some of the bars on the window and patch some of the holes in the wall and get it ready for painting. And so it's going to be an exciting day. If you're able to come, please be there. We'll work from 9 till about 3 or 4. You can come till during any time, uh, at any time during that time and help. There will be a meal provided. And so that does mean, though, don't just come for the meal. Um, so now that you know there is a meal provided, please don't just show up at lunch and leave and say, what a work day. Uh, no, plan to be there and help us, uh, help us a bit. That'd be wonderful. Um, we will be do, having um, other things going on, of course, with Camp Victory and all those things. Uh, some of our visitation and things that would normally go on will be held up just a little bit, but please keep that in mind and, and uh, plan to be there to help if you can. Now, my wife has put the ministry workday in there at 10 a.m., so you can come at 10, but I'll be there at 9. So if you're able to be there at 9, that'll be wonderful. Very good. That's all the notices and announcements I have. We have the privilege this week of having uh, Peter Hewins up to, uh, to visit with us. Many of you remember Peter. He's from Exeter, and um, he spent a term with us here with Debbie and Carla and did a wonderful job. And he is now going into his second year or third year? Third year at Crown Hall. And uh, he's come up to be with us this weekend. And uh, he was preaching at Norris Green this morning, and I think he did a wonderful job. And so please pray for him. And I've asked Peter to come up and share with us what God's doing in his life, and perhaps share with us something from God's Word that God's been speaking to him about. He's not going to preach, but perhaps share something that will encourage you. And so, Peter, if you'll come along, please, and share something with us this evening. And um, I was thankful to hear that even some of the people who I met in my first term here were still praying for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, a, that's a great lesson to know that people are still praying for you, even though... They can't see what you're doing and they don't know what you're doing, but they still pray for you and they want you to help uh, God to help you. And um, I thank God for how he's drawn me in these last couple of years and going to Bible college and being part of various other experiences, i.e. gospel missions and other uh, church openings and even opportunities to preach. And uh, I never thought I would be uh, having the opportunities to preach or stand behind a pulpit, but I thank the Lord that you know, he shows you more than what you expect of yourself. And um, he gives you the ability to do things if you just give him your availability. And uh, he can work through you more than what you expect. Even as a young age or even an older person, he can still use us in his work. And um, for a verse in the Bible, um, I went to a church in Colchester. And uh, one of the members there showed me this verse and it stuck with me. And it's in Psalm chapter 16 and verse number 11. And it says... Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And he says, as long as you keep um, dwelling in the presence of the Lord, you would have joy. And he will show you the fullness of the path that you are to take. And as for my life, I want the Lord to, to show me the path that he has for me to take. And I ask that you would continue to pray for me as I seek the Lord for his will in the future for my life. And that he will guide me in the way that I should go. And that to know that there are pleasures forevermore, even just sticking close to the Savior and just doing the work of the Lord. So I, I ask that you would pray for me as I go into my last year of Bible college and also what the Lord has for me after that. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Amen. Please do pray for him. And I think he is still single as well, so you can pray for him about that as well. And uh, there's a... With usually when they come through Liverpool, a lot of them eventually go on to, to get married. And uh, so I'm sure Peter would love for you to pray for him about that as well. So uh, he's, a, he's a few different shades of red, um, but no. Let's keep Peter in our prayers. No, the Lord is using him. Peter uh, is, uh, is doing a wonderful work. And uh, he, was, he was nothing but a blessing and encouragement here. He had one thing that he used to say when he first got here. And he had the habit of saying he was tired. And... Uh, we, we I, eventually one day I had to come to Peter and I said, okay, Peter, I said, we have people that come and they, they have worked for all day and they come to help in the youth rally and afterwards and Sunday school and those things. I said, and then they go back home to their families. I said, one thing I don't ever want to hear from you is that you're tired. And you know something? I've never heard Peter say I'm tired <laughs> ever since. And uh, he is a hard worker 
when we were when we were moving uh, when we were moving from uh, while Peter was here, we moved during Holiday Bible Club, and Peter was a huge help to us. Our, if you've ever been to, to our flat where we're at now, our stairs are, are, are a bit like climbing a mountain. And Peter was the guy who caught the stuff at the bottom and ran him up to the top and ran back down. And uh, such a help and encouragement. I'm thankful for him, and I hope you'll pray for him. Very good. Well, that's um, all the notices and announcements I have. Well, we won't take up a collection this evening. But if you want to give, please continue to give to the Lord's work. And let's ask the Lord to work in these various things. And so I'd like to ask uh, Paul, if you wouldn't mind, to stand and pray for these uh, gifts that we'll receive and pray for the works that are going on all around the, the country and here in this church. Most heavenly and gracious Father, we do thank you for the privilege that we have to be here this Lord's Day. We do thank you, Lord, for the services that have been and, Lord, for the, the service this evening. Lord, we thank you uh, for the children and the young people that have been in this afternoon and also this evening, Lord. And we pray particularly for them that thou will bless them, Lord, and thou will save their precious souls. We thank you for them and for the encouragement that they are. But Lord, we pray, Lord, that thou save them and show them their need of a Savior. Lord, we do pray, Lord, for anyone that's here tonight that's outside of thee, Lord. We pray, Lord, that thou will do the same for them and that they will to realize, Lord, that without thee they are nothing. And Lord, we do pray, Lord, that you can be that encouragement to them and that example to those that are outside of thee. Lord, we thank you. For everything that's come in, Lord, giving you all the honor, praise, and glory. We thank you, Lord, that thou hast met the needs of this place. And Lord, we give thee all the honor, praise, and glory for that, Lord. So many different needs, Lord, and yet thou just continue to provide, and we thank you for it. We pray, Lord, for the forthcoming meetings, and Lord, for the camp history. We pray, Lord, for everything that's said and done, that it may be said and done to thine honor and thy glory. And also for the conference coming up as well. We pray, Lord, that everything, Lord, will be a blessing to us, Lord, and will be of thee. Lord, we pray for this evening, we pray for our pastor, we pray for the words that come out of his mouth that they'll be of thee, and Lord, help us to take something home from the service this evening, Lord, that will transform our lives for the better. We say these words in Christ's name. Amen. Very good. Well, let's take our uh, hymn books once more. We'll stand and sing hymn number 73. Hymn number 73, we'll stand and sing. Here from the world we turn, Jesus to seek. Here may his loving voice graciously speak. Jesus, our dearest friend, while at thy feet we bend, oh, let thy smile descend, tis thee we seek. We'll stand and sing hymn number 73.
same saith he, which hath the sharp two-edged sword. It's very interesting. The reference there to a sharp and two-edged sword is speaking about the word of God. When we were in, we used to have a Friday club. And God willing, at some point, we'll have another midweek kids, children's club in the future. But we had a club called Sword Club. And we would say, when that, in that, uh, in that uh, youth meeting, we would say, Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God is alive. It's able to cut to the heart of a man to bring forth life. It's also able to defend us against death. The word of God is quick and powerful. And notice here again, much like the church at Ephesus, much like the church at Smyrna, the Lord is saying here, I know thy works and where thou dwellest. The idea there of dwelling is the idea of a permanent residency. Meaning, I see where you are, he's saying to the church. I know the works that you're an active church, that you're standing for the faith, that you're doing many wonderful things. And that you're in a place that you're not able to leave. You're not trying to run away from the situation, but rather God has placed you there. And so often that's the tendency, isn't it, sometimes? If we were living in the place of Pergamos, where Satan's seat is, we might would want to get out to the countryside. We might would want to go somewhere where we didn't have to face that opposition. But hold on a moment. Isn't God the one who leads us? Isn't God the one who places us in various different places? And God is saying to the church at per Pergamos, I know, I know your works, and I know where you dwell. I know where I have placed you. The church at Pergamos wasn't started by, uh, it wasn't at the end of the, the day, the Lord used a person to start the church, no doubt. But the church was there because God placed it there. That was God's work. And he's saying, I know where I have placed you. And sometimes, perhaps, we may be tempted to think and look at a map sometimes and think we need to pick and choose exactly where we need to go, where we think God should place us. Perhaps some of you are thinking, I wish God would place me somewhere in a holiday place. I have a few places in mind. I'd love to go there and stay. We, the fact of the matter is, we don't pick and choose where God places us. We follow him, and he leads us. And sometimes he may lead us to a Pergamos. He may lead us into a city that is renowned for its, its animosity against believers. He may lead us to a place where our faith is tried, where it's not easy, where you're not seeing loads of results. He may lead us to a place and a work that is difficult, but God says here, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. The idea and the reference here is, an, is, is simply the satanic throne in which that was ruling over the area. It wasn't the synagogue, rather you could say the throne that was affecting all of the other area. A great persecution against the church. You remember during these times, it wasn't, it wasn't far after some of these times, even in the year, uh, around the year 300, that eventually Constantine would try to mix the church and the world together by declaring Rome a Christian nation. And that rather, in, in, in an interesting time, didn't, didn't really help the church, rather began to pervert the church. This was the time in which they were living. At the moment, the persecution that was happening was from the proconsul for those who were believers to declare Caesar as Lord. And someone might think, well, why wouldn't you just do that? Look, you could say it and not mean it, maybe some would say. Why wouldn't you just burn a bit of incense and, and carry on? That way you didn't have to suffer this kind of persecution. And the angel of the church of Pergamos, these things saith he which hath the sharp two-edged sword, I know thy works and where thou dwellest. But notice here what it says of the church, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. In those days wherein Antipas was faithful, a faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Here you have a church, and you might be tempted to say, many might be tempted to say, well, why don't you just give in? Why don't you just concede to what they're saying? 
Just do it so you don't have to suffer the persecution. You can continue on. Let's not make a big deal out of it. But the problem was not a... The problem here was a conscience issue. To, to admit that Caesar was Lord was to deny Jesus as Lord. It was to go against his faith. And these men, obviously, under these, the believers there at the church in Pergamos, understood who God was. They understood what God had done in them. And the Bible says there that they hold fast his name. Not willing to turn to the right or to the left, but standing for what they believe in. And one of them, perhaps a leader, Antipas, was a faithful martyr who was slain among you. I think oftentimes as we think of Pergamos and we think of those who have gone on before us in martyrdom, how much more of a responsibility when the church of Pergamos felt to hold fast to the faith when one of their own had gone on to be slain? Because he would not renounce his faith. Because he would not bow to something that would go against conscience and the word of God. And therefore... The church would, in essence, be even more emboldened or would have, perhaps have more of a responsibility to hold fast. Why? Because one of us actually was slain for standing for his faith. We live in a country. We stand and ground a city that has a renowned Christian heritage. <coughs> a place, and you can go in various different places all throughout the country and stand literally in places where Christians were burned at the stake. You can stand at that place in Oxford where, uh, where Latimer and Ridley were standing, where they, where, where they were burned for their faith in Christ. Where Hugh, Med L Hugh Latimer cried out to Nicholas Ridley and said, Play the man, Master Ridley, for today we shall light such a candle in England by God's grace as I trust shall never be put out. What an amazing thing to go and stand in a place where those who simply wouldn't bow down to well, two, two things that would go against their conscience. They held fast to the word of God, to the Lord Jesus. And they were willing to be burned for their faith. Quite an amazing thing. The Bible you hold in your hand, the English Bible in your hand today. This Bible is literally the, the, the common man's Bible that we have, that under, able to understand it in our own language. People literally gave their own life so that you could have it. William Tyndale stood at the place where he was burned there just outside of Brussels in, in Belgium. Stood at the place where he was burned for what was his crime? Translating the word of God so that the common man could understand the Bible for himself. He was, he was martyred. Why? Because he wanted the commoner to be able to read and see and understand who God was. He once told the Catholic clergyman, I will cause the plow boy to know more scriptures than you. And that was true in his lifetime. And as we think about the great heritage that we have, Lady Jane Grey, the nine-day queen of England, who went to the, went to the went and had, was beheaded because of her faith. And there are many, many others. Missionaries left from these docks to go around the world to preach the gospel. One of which were highlighted at Camp Victory this year, Mary Slusser, left from the docks of Liverpool to go off. She wasn't from Liverpool, but she was from Scotland. But she left from these docks to go and minister and give her life there in Africa for the gospel's sake. How great of a heritage do we have and how much more of a responsibility, like here in the Church of Pergamos, to say, hold fast. You had one amongst you that, that bled and died for his faith. And I know you're where Satan dwelleth. Hold fast thy faith. But I want you to see here the great temptation in that time. Satan tries to attack in many different ways. He tries to get in exteriorly, and if he can't, he begins to work his way interiorly. And that was happening here at the church of Pergamos. In verse number 14, I have, this is the Lord speaking, a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat the things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. It's very interesting here. The Lord says, I have a few things against thee. Can I tell you, if the Lord says, I have a few things against thee, better write them down. And you better take note of what those things might would be. We see here, he says first and foremost, 
Thou that hast them among you that has that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now you say, well, who is Balaam and what is the doctrine of Balaam? You have to go all the way back into the book of Numbers and remember that when Israel was coming out of Egypt and as they were going to the promised land, Balaam was a prophet who was a prophet for hire, hired by Balak, the king of Moab, to curse Israel, to pr pronounce cursings. In other words, he would, he would say whatever needed to be said because Balak was paying him and he could be bought. And he tried, but he was literally stopped by the Lord from cursing Israel. But he came up with another plan in order to infiltrate Israel. His plan was to cause the Moabite women, who were idolaters, who didn't believe in the God of Israel, to go in and seduce and marry Israelites. And therefore, though it was a long plan, it was a long game, by allowing this Moabitish influence into Israel, it would then go on to corrupt the children and the next generation. And guess what? It worked. Seducing the hearts of the children of Israel to come away and live like the Moabites. And you say, what does that doctrine look like in the church? It comes in in various different forms, but it is always tends towards worldliness. Coming in in various different forms, seeking to take away the holiness of worship. Seeking to take away the, the holiness of the Christian life, to cast doubt upon the authority of Scripture. Seeking to pervert man's heart away from a holy God and more to a, a very worldly system. That's exactly what would happen, the doctrine of Balaam, and it began to creep in. It began to creep in in various different forms. And here's what the Lord says. And when he says, I know thy works, he knows the good things that are going on, and he also knows those who have crept in, who are seeking to pervert the flock away from the word of God, away from a sincere Christian life, away from that which is true and right, and to a more sensual lifestyle. Notice here, again, in this passage in verse number 14. Hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Can I tell you that's the way that the devil always creeps in? He creeps in subtly. He comes in in very small forms. He comes in in very clever ways to get in. And he begins to cause you to cast doubt on the word of God. He begins to make you think in your mind that you can have your life one way and another. He begins to delegitimize the word of God in your life, cause you to question and doubt it. To doubt that God really is going to judge you. To doubt that God really is concerned about a holy life. That God's more loving. He's not, he's not so much concerned about your little mishaps. And all along the while, he's pulling you more and more and more away. We said on Wednesday night, he's pulling you into a trap. He's pulling you into a snare. And those snares are always very hard to get out of. We see here that there was worldliness that was coming in. And then also in verse number 15, So thou hast also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. The word here, Nicolaitans, and there are many different people that have many different ideas about this word and what perhaps it could mean. Some say perhaps it could mean the very same thing as the doctrine of Balaam. But I think that's a bit far-fetched because they're both mentioned separately. There is a group of people that are holding the doctrine of Balaam, worldliness, trying to mix worship and the church with worldliness. And there are also those who are creating a hierarchy in the church. The word Nicolaitan simply means victory over people. Victory over people. Seeking to lord and create a, a, a higher class, if you will, to be able to dictate what others can do. You see this happening all throughout church history. People lording over God's heritage. Trying to play the intermediator between God and man. 
trying to back bypass the Lord Jesus, seeking to tell people what they ought to believe rather than allowing people to see it for themselves. And so you have here two very dangerous things that are creeping into the church. And by the way, they've been around since Pergamos. They're still in the world today. Trying to mix the world and the church together. Not allowing the church to be separate. Thinking that the church needs to become more like the world. And God says, from that doctrine, stay away. Remove the doctrine of Balaam. And then you have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And notice what God says about that doctrine. He hates it. He hates the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. That which seeks to lord over men and interpret the word of God for men. And tell men what they ought to believe rather than allowing men to believe it for themselves. Even holding and saying they have the keys of salvation. And only by belonging to them can you be truly saved. God says, which thing I hate. Notice what he says in verse 16. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly. And will fight against them with the word, the sword of my mouth. In James chapter number 4, the Lord says this as well. As we're looking at this passage of scripture. James chapter number 4. If you look with me, James chapter number four, the word of God says, we looked at this on Wednesday night, ye adulteresses and adult, your adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. The idea here of friend is not that we're not to be kind and loving to people of the world. But it is someone who entertains that worldly mindset, who has come to love that mindset, has come to love that friendship, and is unable to separate from the sins of the world. And God says that is an enemy. It, the person who entertains that is at enmity with God and becomes an enemy of God. What a horrible thing to think as a Christian that I could, when I entertain when I entertain sinful things, I could be God's enemy. I could be fighting for the opposing team. Why? Because I've entertained that spirit of Balaam. I could be on the, the I could be against God. Why? Because I'm having my friendship with the world. And by the way, there are some here tonight, and you may not have been aware of this, but you are an enemy of God. We don't say that lovingly. We don't say that shockingly or hatingly. We say that lovingly because sometimes you don't realize that you're actually against God, but all of us were born enemies of God, reprobates. We were born with a sin nature. And until someone comes to Christ, the Bible says we're an enemy of God. Why? Because we're a friend of the world, the world system. So the Bible tells us here in this passage, it's very clear he says, so thou hast also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. What does God say? Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against thee with a sword. We're reminded here of the church of Pergamos. A church that was doing very well. A church that was sitting under the throne of Satan, and yet they were holding fast the faith. But yet there were battles that must take place. There was things that must be confronted. It's my spirit sometimes, and perhaps it's yours as well, to be a person that's not of confrontation. We don't like that. We don't like to be in confrontation. We don't like to talk about those things, and we don't like to even confront people perhaps in different areas. But at times we see in Scripture here, and this passage is very clear, the Lord says the spirit of Balaam and the spirit of the Nicolaitans must be dealt with. Or else the Lord says, I will come quickly against them with the sword. But in verse number 17, he leaves us with this. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give him hidden manna, and a white stone, and in that stone a new name, which is written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. It is perhaps thought about in this passage that there were things that at the church of Pergamos, because of their stand, they were missing out on. 
benefits, food, regular privileges that they were to have, and yet they were going without. And perhaps that was the temptation of why to give in to this doctrine. Maybe there were them, them saying, some saying, well, look, let's just mix with the state and the government so that we can get the provisions that we need. And God says to him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. Isn't that wonderful? The Lord Jesus said something similar in John 4. I have meat to eat that ye know not of. We know in the Old Testament the Lord provided manna all for the children of Israel in their time of wandering. Can I tell you, the Lord is able to take care of you if you'll but stand for him. And that's what he was saying here to the church at Pergamos. If you'll stand, I'll provide. If you'll hold fast, if you'll deal with what's going on in the church at this time, I will take care of you. And God help us tonight to hold fast to him. A wonderful Savior who is able to keep us and even make us thrive and prosper, even if we feel or we are in under the throne of Satan. Perhaps there's no greater place to minister than where the Satan has his greatest hold. We bow with me in a word of prayer and let's ask God's blessing. Oh Lord, tonight we thank thee and praise thee for thy word. We pray, O oh Lord, that thou wilt please be glorified in this place. We thank thee, Father, that thy word is timeless, that the problems that were going on in the church of Pergamos yet resound today. We say that, Lord, shamingly, but thankful that we can learn and grow. And we pray that we would be people that have an ear to hear. Please help us tonight. Lord, we need thy grace. We need thy love. We pray that thou please help us. There are many people in this city who need to hear the truth of the gospel. Please, O oh Lord, help us. Help us, O oh God, in a mighty way. Stand with us, Lord. May we feast on that hidden manna. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go take your hymn books. We'll stand and sing hymn number 311. Stand and sing hymn number 311. I hear thy welcome voice that calls me, Lord, to thee for cleansing in thy precious blood that flowed on Calvary. Let's stand and sing hymn number 311.
of prayer. I'd like to invite you. I think we have tea and coffee next door, so plan to stay back. Sorry, there's no tea and coffee? No, I think Julie's Oh, okay, very good. No, 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 she, you're probably right. So there's no tea and coffee tonight, but please, by all means, feel free to stay in fellowship. And uh, please pray for us this week as we go down to Crown Hall, praying God would bless the work. And we look forward to seeing you on Wednesday night. But let's be dismissed in a word of prayer and trust God to help us. And uh, the Lord's on our side. We're trusting Him, and we can go forward with Him. So let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. And I'd like to ask at this time, uh, David, if you wouldn't mind, to please close us in a word. Until we have the opportunity to meet with you again in the